Mind Crime Liberty Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss, does anyone actually believe in democracy? Other people say, oh, democracy is the best of the systems we've got available, or democracy is wonderful. But um, does anybody actually really believe in just democracy? Tim? No, no one actually believes in unfettered democracy. That That's that's the first claim. Least of all, anarchists, the left, Marxists, um, the American Democratic Party, the Labour Party, none of these people believe in actual democracy. Um, um, the left, I would argue, has this sort of natural rights progressivism view. But no, I, I'm going to bring up some sort of examples, which might be considered caricatures. But nonetheless, I'm going to bring them up because I think it's relevant just to, to first establish why the left, before we get to the right, um, why they don't believe in democracy. Because uh, oftentimes you'll say, well, Hoppe's not a democracy, Hoppe's not advocating democracy, therefore that's bad, therefore he's not a libertarian, therefore he's equivalent to Adolf Hitler, or something along the lines, you see that. So so I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to establish how the left themselves also don't believe in democracy. So let's say if 51 people say that, you know, gays should be shot or homosexuals should be shot or put in jail, um, and I, I bet given certain areas, geographical areas, for example, in the United States, in Britain, and let alone in certain areas of the world where homosexuality is actually illegal still, um, you could probably get a majority of 51 percent. You could probably even get higher, like 70, a super majority. Now, would you, if, if a Marxist or a Leninist or a narco syndicalist or, you know, a, Jer- a Corbinista or a Sandinista said, oh, well, democracy has spoken. The people have spoken. We just have to put them in jail. No, of course not. They would not think that. They would think that in spite of that. They would think minority, that they think that rights are more important. Um, and interestingly, recently was our brouhaha with the Methodist church where the um, the more darker churches, so to speak, are more traditional and the more um, the more the more not dark churches are more liberal and on the, that question they adopted the traditional plan and actually so by the virtue of democracy um, you know the the result uh, happened that way uh, and again you do this other thing you do this science too you know if Eddie Diaz um, thinks the world's flat I mean if, if you got enough room of people in the room that thought the world was flat would the left think that no 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 I mean one it doesn't matter what you know, 99 people think that something is the case and one people do not think the case. You know, truth is not democratic in that regard. If you take a sort of view that truth is this thing that's independent of, 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 you know, con- uh, Democrat, dem- democratic conventions. So those are two, two quick examples of why, you know, a pl- you know, and again, a third example, plurality of people reject wearing masks and so forth. You know, if you ask a sort of a COVID pandemic or advocate, you know, they say, oh, you you must wear your mask because you're advocating violence. It's aggression, even especially you libertarians who ran AP because that's aggression. Uh, now, again, that's an argument that actually the only one of the few arguments I vaguely actually um, agree with in some ways or actually the idea that private property owners have sovereignty over their property and therefore they can set the rules. But again, even Gary Johnson type libertarians don't even believe in those. So even in that regard, they don't even care about um, those. But again, you could argue that, that then, then they're also – invalidating their principle of democracy because property is not um, um, related to democracy either. Um, so, so yeah, so those are those are three examples, like quick examples. Um, science, um, you know, banning certain activities, mask wearing, and those numerous other things that, you know, no one would say if 70% of people said this is not the case, um, th- then we'd have to follow this. No one would say that. So, Swinton, I just brought up three quick examples. So far, what do you make of my case here that, first of all, no one believes in democracy? Swinton? It's obviously true that I, uh, that nobody actually believes purely in majoritarian decision making, and least not in all areas. Um, the most of hardcore Democrat would be that anything that anybody does must be subject to uh, majoritarian decision making over a particular defined area, although I suppose in principle it ought to be the world. And 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 all humans, or although I suppose if you want to go down the Peter Singer line, you might somehow include apes uh, as well. But nobody takes such a position seriously. Uh, I mean, that's obviously true. Um, but what is annoying is a lot of the self-described supporters of democracy don't actually say what they think uh, and what they want to actually take place. A good example of this would be, I think we remember a good man called David Wolf, 
who had uh, a debate with David Friedman, or no, Richard Wolf, Richard Wolf, and um, he said he was advocating work, worker democracy. That is in the workplace, you know, it would be run by the workers in the majoritarian uh, way. And so David Friedman then brings it, well, what if like 51 percent of them don't want to work or they just uh, want to get rid of majoritarian decision making? You know, can they do that? Uh, or, you know, if 51 percent of the workers want to enslave you, 49 percent, can they do it? And he's like, well, no, of course, I no one believes in that. But the advocates of democracy never actually say what they want. They just hide behind the word democracy because it has good vibes and they simply won't say anything. What they really mean is democracy plus and in many cases, liberal democracy. That is, well, we want to maintain uh, what you might consider the natural rights or if you want to take a utilitarian approach, um, rights which are good just for the benefits of the greatest happiness for the greatest number need not be natural in the same, that same sense. Um, this is what we want. We want sort of like general liberalism of some description and democracy is kind of just a way of uh, achieving that goal. But rarely will they actually outline it's actually the liberalism uh, that they uh, actually advocate. And by liberalism, I mean, to some extent, forms of individual rights. Um, as I said, they, you might not put it in terms of rights, but, you know, procedural rights, uh, innocence or proven guilty, uh, you know, certain levels of bodily autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. Non-discrimination, um, not being allowed to have critical things said about you. Keep going, Swithin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, oh, so, they certainly would. Um, I, I, I was being kind at this point to sort of the the believer in um democracy is the best means to achieve sort of classical liberalism but you are certainly right most of the self-described defenders of democracy uh will have um how should we say a more expansive view of liberalism that said of course um there are some sort of conservative types who like uh, democracy of sorts but of course which we'll get to later as, as it were a much more constrained um a more constrained view of uh democracy and has many more sort of quote unquote checks and balances etc um so yeah that it, it, everybody who advocates democracy is advocating not just for a, a, a voting mechanism but they want a voting mechanism over particular areas with certain areas being cordoned off from majoritarian decision making one of the quick tensions within democracy is over how big of the area ought to be what one's voting for um now this this is one of the this is one of the first tensions here so as of now up until now for as much as people are against um a phobias and, and various phobias xenophobia and so national everyone's against all these things we still mainly vote based on nation states and the nation state boundaries were largely at least in the west drawn up us in the 30 years war or a little before then and, and and of course in other parts of the world maybe a little afterwards but they've been all largely drawn around what is basically ethnic lines um which is very politically incorrect so 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 the actual voting system currently we, we don't we, we don't vote for a global one world government we don't vote for a global one world government and we vote for regional governments of of westphalian nation states or federations um, that still remains how what we, exactly we vote for. We vote for districts. We vote for local people. Um, and depending on the system, different places have different system, so parliamentary, federal, um, there's different systems. And there's also different theories of democracy, too, ex exactly what exactly goes into it. Uh, like here in the United States, different states have different, um, you know, one of the com common critiques is land doesn't vote. Well, in a certain way, land does vote. Um, for better or for worse. I mean, that, so but it's just different theories of it. You have majoritarian populism theories, and and, as, and you have different different types of theories that go into who exactly, you know. And as far as the representatives themselves, forgetting the systems, the representatives that fill the systems, because like the you know, U.S. Senate has a hundred senators, and they represent two apiece for each state. People forget the fact that this was this was done to keep the small states happy. Um, there's the big state, the small state plan. Um. Uh, it means that like North Dakota is technically sovereign. The 500,000 people that live in North Dakota have like like they they have much more influence point than than the 
six, the 40 million people that live in California. This is often critique that throws up with the Electoral College. I like the Electoral College for complicated reasons. Um, um, but nonetheless, that, that, that's one of the common treats. Land doesn't vote. Well, it's worth pointing out, you know, Mexicans don't vote for the American president. Canadians don't vote for American president. Both Mexican and Canadians have a huge get influenced by American policy significantly. Why not Mexicans and Canadians vote? Um, now, now, the Democrats and the left would like it if Mexicans voted for the left. They would say, oh, we should have them vote. But oh, interestingly, if, you know, let's say, let's say, let's say if we included Russians into the American election system, if, if the Mech Democrats want to have a lot of Mexicans vote, how about the Republicans include Russians? Um, I bet, I bet a disproportionate number of Russians would have voted for Donald Trump in the last elections. Um, um, so, so as you see, no one believes in global elections. Um, no one believes in global elections. They're all done regionally. They're not, they're not, they are very local. It's local. Um, and that's that's never tension with anarchism. You know, if you take the sort of panarchist view of anarchism, you have decentralization. One of the, one of the principles of decentralization is different areas will have different things. There might be some area, let's say Gary Northville, where it's a crime to, you know, there's a crime to do all sorts of things. I, we don't need to mention them. I think anyone who's familiar with the Mises Institute is aware of Gary North. Um, um, but there also could be, you know, Margaret uh, Margaret Sangerville or something like that, where the opposite things are true. So, so yeah, so we, so in terms of decentralization, we we would not have one world uh, rules. And actually, that's that's if, to me that's a perfectly fine system. Um, um, but then again, it takes away from the regional the regionalism. So Swift and so far, what do you make about it? Do, do, do you think that's somewhat ironic that you know for all the talk of one worldism and universalism that we still vote basically locally and no one really thinks about that Swithin? I agree and I, I think uh, there's an even better example of this is actually the nation states which aren't based around ethnic lines and basically everybody agrees that they don't work and that is basically most of Africa because it's not done by tribal lines which would be what you would think you would do if you were going for the traditional sort of European nation state. You have vast numbers of diverse tribal groups who despise each other. And uh, it's pretty well con uh, lots of consensus that the the uh, countries in Africa make zero sense and is the worst run continent on Earth. Um, so uh, it, it's kind of ironic um, in, in that regard, because uh, d democracy just isn't, isn't working well enough because because it's not done on a, a, an individual tribal basis. Uh, you know, we, we try to do a multi-tribal one and it, and it simply doesn't work, which, of course, goes against the whole melting pot mentality uh, of the left who would uh, typically advocate democracy. And they'd be the ones who were going, oh, no, the evil colonialists, they, they drew up the, 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 the uh, country lines badly. And it's like, well, OK, how should have done it? Well, why don't we have Hutuville and Tutsiville? It's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is ethnic nationalism. Um, but... <laughs> they would probably stop talking to you before they had to admit that. Um, but yeah, I mean, where you vote, how you vote. I mean, even on on voting systems, I think you've mentioned like the Electoral College, there isn't one way of doing sort of democracy. I mean, do you have direct democracy? Do you just have um, referenda on particular issues and you can vote for them if you want to and you vote against them if you don't want to? Do you vote in representatives? who um, do what they want or are they supposed to just be a conduit for the will of the people you know that's a different way of doing it um, so again this, this the sloganeering uh, with respect to um, democracy uh, s simply doesn't make uh, any 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 real sense um, I mean uh, I've alluded to this so far one of the questions is you know what are you actually allowed to vote for? Can can the public vote democracy out? Uh, how long does the other is their will binding for? I mean, does it just bind on the individual? And if so, for how long? Uh, because, I mean, you, you could imagine a situation in which uh, the public go, well, we need a strong man leader to uh, organize the country from some foreign invasion. So what we'll do is we'll vote in, I don't know, some proper sort of uh, Mussolini type figure. And we, and we want to make him president for life and suspend all elections until his death. So, well, can you do that? I almost guaranteed anybody who goes, oh, yes, democracy, we support democracy, will go, no, 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 of course you can't do that. You have to spend voting. It's like, well, OK, well, why can't we get rid of voting? Well, because it's democracy plus. What they don't do is 
most of the advocates of democracy, inverted commas, are incredibly disingenuous. What they have is they have a vision for society is what they want society to be like. Um, but they don't actually articulate that. They sort of just hide behind this neutrality of um, of democracy because it has that sort of because it's just a decision making uh, method without actually articulating why. So, for example, uh, what Richard Wolff didn't do in his debate with David Friedman was actually say, well, why he thought workplace democracy was a good idea. He obviously has an idea concept individual workers don't have enough control over the uh, the production process when um when ruled by bosses and so you have sort of like bossism as some of the left libs would like to talk about and somehow this is this is bad for the an individual you know uh, what you need is a uh, you if you're a worker in a certain factory you need some form of input because it, it's Maybe it's better for the company in one respect, but it's, it's it kind of better for humanity as a whole and individual flourishing. You want to be uh, a, a uh, you want to have a meaningful input. You mean you don't just want to be a cog in a machine. I mean, okay, well, as far as that goes, I mean, I, I can see why you would you would think that. But again, the, 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 this is not what a lot of self-described um, advocates of democracy do because you have to keep badgering them to tell them for for you keep needing to badger them. So they tell you actually what they want, as opposed to just going, oh, yes, democracy, democracy. Yay. Um, so, yeah, I, I th think that is kind of just ridiculous. And, and then you get onto the question, as you mentioned, like, who can vote? I mean, you know, who is allowed to vote? Can, can criminals vote? Can anybody over a certain age vote? Why? Um, I mean, traditionally, you had um, land ownership requirements or property ownership requirements of certain descriptions and you, why have those why not have something else um so those are my thoughts on that so far your your comments about them being disingenuous is entirely correct i that i've watched the friedman wolf debate uh, and i thought i, I I've, I've always found um wolf to be into a large scale disingenuous when it comes to um his advocate democracy as is most of the left um the left you know, if, if are, are you if you had a if you had a socialist society, would you allow? Could you go back to a capitalist society? Now, I think Brent Langle in there said, or another debate said, well, you know, people don't choose to go back to old systems. Well, is that is that is that entirely true for all of history? Um, I and mean, people don't choose to go back to old systems. I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's worth pointing out for all the existence of egalitarian marriages, for example. Um, now, it is true the courts don't enforce them, but there are a significant number of Amish people. There's a significant number of reform people. You know, I think you can still get. So, so there's a sort of older view of marriage, which is sort of um, which is a sort of pe people giving away their rights um, to their husbands, which is sort of an older type of view on that. Um, so, th so there is some ways in people go back. And, and I think this circles back to two areas where, again, the left is, and as, as well as disingenuous. Um, and again, we're both sort of right-wing libertarians. We, I mean, when we read Hoppe, we don't have any problem with the fact that Hoppe is not a Democrat. That's not, that's in a way a feature, not a bug. Um, so we're admitting that straight up. They're sort of dodging around the bush, saying, you know, using it as a, a cover. Um, but this is where, so take, take if, you're on, if you're on a plane or you're on a boat, um, or is this going to be a democracy? Well, there are clearly a class of experts. I mean, this is where I think the Bukharin quote or whatever, some Pradhan quote, well, I accept the authority of the bootmaker. OK, you can accept the authority of the bootmaker. OK, so we already delegated one, delegated one cl class of people, experts, so, so to speak, out there. Um, um, now, now this, this is where it gets tricky. You know, I, 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 you know, experts have their own motives. I mean, you know, ex experts are not... Experts are not platonic kings. Um, and I'm going to one theory of, of, of voting. So I, I, I've been through a political science program at Mainstream American University. I've, I've done these theories of voting, these theory of, of like representation. But one theory. So what exactly is the elector or representator you, you, you represent? Uh, and th this shows up in the labor union, union debate, for example. You know, so like the Pullman cars, you know, you take the Pullman cars, the Pullman car, who's had a labor union. There was a, you know, what was any of the Pullman waiter people in the union leadership? At first, not really, because because they were all staffed by lawyers. Why? Because, the, you know, they had to have a certain expertise, knowledge to deal with the owners and management and the other group. So the actually ownership had a different task 
than the lawyers, which already account, which already then established the fact that the division of labor uh, there. So, so even even on labor unions, like the actual union management, so to speak, um, um, does not have the same task as the you know at the grunts on the ground, so to speak. Um, um, but but then and again think. But, they, but but there's two theories about like what exactly representatives are. The people you send to Whitehall or or your local state capital or Washington. One theory is the states they just they just reinforce the will. They they represent the will. The people will something, um, and then they just you know will it incognito, not incognito, in absence of them. Um, the other theory is that they are like a professional class. You elect a person, that person goes and searches out the truth of what the best policy is, and that person then goes and establishes the policy. So even if even if most of the con the, the most of the congregation, most of the um, well actually actually a good word to call them, most of the populace um, say a similar idea thinks that immigration should be banned. Um, let's say they go and they meet at some society. Um, and they find out that actually immigration might benefit them. So they decide to vote for open borders or something like that. Now, that's contra democracy. All the constituents said they wanted closed borders or most of them, 90 percent, let's say. So that that's more of the professional class politician or professional class representative model. Um, um, and this uh, model This is not they're not instituting the will of the people. They're instituting the contra to the will of the people. Uh, so, so there, there's a clear where, where, and this is actually the Garing principle, I think that that he used in his trial, um, you know, he, the, the dictatorship principle in the tri Nuremberg trials of Hermann Garing, where he said, well, well, the people have spoken, um, and we have to do this. And he actually quoted FDR as saying FDR did the same thing by enacting the managerial revolution and stuffing the courts um, to get his New Deal passed. Um, so, so yeah. I, I, the, the, the two theories that go into how exactly what that person does, they're not, they're not the same class. And this is where, this is where democracy again breaks down. You know, again, back to my example I was about to get to was like on a plane. You know, no one's, there's a funny quote, there's a funny cartoon that says that the passengers are saying, I don't like the way this plane's being flown to the pilot. Let me fly that. Okay, again, this goes back to the bootmaker example. Okay, sure, the pilot can has a certain kind of knowledge to how the you know the flaps and how to land the plane. Okay, okay, but then this is where it gets tricky. You know, who decides where the plane goes? Now, is that is that only the pilot's decision? Now, this is where I can in theory be okay with democracy. You know, if you know you want to go to place X instead of place Y. But even there, even there, um, the left doesn't. It, it, people want to fly the plane to um um you know, Gary Northville, so to speak. Now I'm using this not, not just as a literal, as a figurative metaphor in a sense. The left will say, no, no, we, we, we people who don't want to go there should get go off. Okay, go ahead. I mean, that I'm just bringing up some issues within, you know, this idea of the having experts. The fact that we need experts is one of the problems with democracy itself. I think Aristotle thought that democracy or Rousseau that only would work in like a very small villages um, and I would assume that would mean that not much division of labor. But yeah, so I think, can you continue on this point? Oh, certainly. Um, of course, it makes sense that, um, you know, the pilot flies the plane. And so it, it kind of makes sense that you have if any sort of democratic system that it, it seems to make more sense as a form of a professional class of a certain description, because um, they know what they're talking about. You know, that, that kind of makes sense. And in the same way, um, if you want somebody to fix your boiler, you get a guy who knows how to fix boilers. I mean, that kind of makes sense. The problem is with with voting and and democracy is um, that, uh, well, for one thing, they're going to have power over you in the same way that the, um, the uh, heating engineer isn't going to have. Because you can you can rent him and send him away, or or, or do something like that. Whereas um, in, in in democratic decision making, uh, everyone has to abide by the decision. And of course, there's tends to be asymmetry of uh, of the law of how it applies to certain people um, with respect to governments and electors and things. Um, but even say in a plain situation, a plain, I suppose the best argument you can make for democracy as a decision making principle is if you have a situation where you have mutually exclusive outcomes in a very sort of defined time period um 
So, oh, I, I don't know. The plane will crash. We need to decide where we will land the plane. Well, OK, uh, I could see why that you could put that as a democratic decision, although there may be better and worse places to land. Uh, but when we're talking about this before, you've mentioned how when you go out with your, your uh, for meals with your family, you kind of vote on where to go. And that, that kind of works OK. Um, in my experience, in a lot of times, um, actually having majoritarian decision making within families doesn't really work very well at all. Um, either what you need is someone to tell them where they're going or what I think probably works best, which doesn't which isn't really a democratic way of doing it. What you do is if you're going to go out to a restaurant like and like for five days in a row when you're on holiday whatever just allow each family member to decide which restaurant they're going to obviously of course within a particular price bracket uh which again isn't really democratic because i decide that um so that they get to go to where they want to go we did this similarly actually on family holidays like what would you want to do when you're here well okay you have a day you have a day you have a day and you can do what you want to do on those days because of course the problem would be if you have majoritarian decision making in that scenario one of the children could well not end up going where they wanted to go because nobody else wanted to and they would be uh, always outvoted so there'll be democracy always tends to remove any individual um power or autonomy um now I think this is where, going back to the Friedman-Wolf debate, um, Friedman makes an interesting uh, rhetorical move as to what uh, capitalism is or free markets is, which is uh, competitive dictatorship. We're not in democracy. It's like, you know, we, I own my property. I can use it as I wish. But if I don't do it very well, I won't earn very much money. Uh, and uh, consumers will go elsewhere. Uh, and I think certainly the idea of competitive dictatorship is one which is going to yield better results anyway on what people want to buy and would also uh, actually give teeth to individual autonomy, uh, autonomy and rights in a way that uh, a view which tends towards the more sort of democracy overall ideological view of democracy that the left typically have simply would just remove. And that's even in, in the case of um, sort of like the uh, left anarchists as well. Yes, I would agree. Um, I would agree going forward. I, I want to go back to the point about like another problem here with the um, workplace democracy as well as democracy in general is that is is the existence of truth and the existence of better things. Um, I, um, now, this is where this is where interesting. I want to bring up Michelle Foucault here. Michelle Foucault, I brought him up before on this um, um, viewpoint. Um, and this is this is our link truth best practices. Um, as well as workplace democracy all together. Um, in, uh, one of the things about Michelle Foucault is that the belief that power is superior to democracy. Um, that, that's, that's one of the things that I think is true here. That, now, when Foucault was arguing against Chomsky, he's Chomsky, he's fairly immoral. He's ambivalent about it. He doesn't think it's a great thing that the police, the army, and the courts dominate society. But again, he thinks it's just the way it is, not necessarily the way it ought to be. And, and Chomsky has this sort of natural law socialism view. Um, you know, you know, powerful people or powerful organizations ought not to exist um, um, or powerful narratives ought not to exist. And this is actually Foucault's, Foucault's theory of science is to me interesting uh, because I, you know, I've seen this on, on sub edits of some of the Keith Preston, you know, Facebook and pages. You know, people will say, well, isn't it funny how the right has this Foucauldian theory of science? And I think eh, not really. It's actually fairly it's actually fairly reasonable. I mean, the, 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 the presuppositions of the Calvinists have been saying is for years, science without a certain form of a priori thinking is is just a kind of um, empirical masturbation exercise that can go anywhere um, and consult your own handoff. Or, you know, um, that's Hoppe says in his praxeology lecture as well, um, empiricism without. Um, but not, but then that, that's not that's not the exact point. But then again, Foucault has this argument that, that it's, it's rooted in like um, you know, certain power structures that the universities became popular um, because they were had the armies and the courts and th those things behind them. But then if you think about why did the, these certain organizations become wealthy? Um, why did these organizations become wealthy? Why did science, you know, why, why, did the, why did the Catholics sell the, why did Columbus sell the ocean blue and not, you know, the, the, the Polynesians or the other, the Chinese or the other groups? Well, this goes back into theories we did in our older episodes. Um, there's certain there's certain recipes, so to speak. They're just better at producing results 
than other recipes. Um, and, and this is power. Now, this, this also goes back just to the socialism versus capitalism debate. When Khrushchev was banging his shoe, he was banging his shoe because he thought he will bury you in terms of producing consumer goods, which, again, is funny because a lot of leftists today like to say that one of the troubles with capitalism is produces too many consumer goods. But nonetheless, Khrushchev back then was wanting to produce a lot of consumer goods. Um, um, and if the Soviet Union could have produced consumer goods at a better rate than the United States, and this is what this is where the David Friedman viewpoint comes back in. Um, um, most Americans would have com converted to communism. The fact that the fact that Britain and garbage men in Britain were making more money than 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 high po party members in 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 Russia. Now again, there's factors that made Britain wealthier going into 1914. But then again. You know, if you can draw back the clock to 1700 or 1500, Britain and Russia are at the same place. Um, um, so, so you know, it's 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 even there those examples start falling back. And you think, well, Britain had this sort of Reformation part, the Glorious Revolution, various other things that got. And, and actually, I think Thomas More itself was enshrined in the Kremlin. I think so. So you know, so but again, there are certain recipes. And actually, the socialist critique of capitalism, if you really dip bury down to it, is the idea that they will bury us. That there is a superior, superior hierarchy, higher hashtag hierarchy form of mode of production. It's not, it's not democratic at all. It, 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 it's that's why they say it's scientific. And this is go back, back. Science is subordinate, you know, democracy is subordinate to science. So then, yeah, people can vote on what color shoes they want to wear, or certain, you know, the, the certain side dishes, so to speak. But even there, you know. There are certain you know, now again, this is why we did the Kevin Carson episode. Um, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if you could run railroads and certain other organizations minor scale better. That that that's an empirical question. Um, they, uh, David Friedman did in another debate brought up you know licensing laws and all intellectual property, but the left doesn't spend much time attacking that. I mean I, I don't watch, but the main thing that Bernie Sanders and Jerry and Corbyn seem to want is open borders. Well, they used to. They flip flopped on that and free health care for all, which is Chris creates monopoly. So, you know, the functional left just advocates for positive rights um, um, funded by taxation for a large state. Um, but nonetheless, if you really dig down in the argument, they don't even they, they they think that it's a superior mode of production. So so, you know, you can have workplace democracy. But if again, if a lot of people shirk, a lot of people don't work or a lot of people work, air quote, inefficiently. Um, um, and then another group comes along. They make better food. Um, you know, this happened to the delivery services in the United States. The the state government used the government used to have a, the U.S. Postal Service used to have a monopoly on it. FedEx and UPS and DHL came in. And they broke up the monopoly. Um, now, I mean, they deliver packages better, cheaper, and quicker. Um, now, again, UPS and FedEx, they're not perfect corporations. They're not perfect. Blah blah blah. They're more competitive dictatorships. I agree. They get kickbacks. Yes, Kevin Carson. Yes, I totally agree. They're not perfect, but they're less. They're, you know, they're more, you don't pay the post office in a way. If, if I had a, you know, you know, the post office, I would argue, is closer to Murray Rothbardville. The, the, the post office is probably further away from Murray Rothbardville than DHL or whatever the private shipping company is in your local area. So, so what, what do you make about my superior and inferior modes of production? What do you make about my other viewpoints So how... Um, you, know, you can't you can't get out of this. So, Swithin. Oh yeah, certainly with uh, modes of production. I mean, oh, if, if I have no in principle objection to um, work workplace democracy, if it's a good form of production for a particular firm, then fine, use it. If it isn't, then not. Um, it's um, I, mean, I mean, okay, uh, Richard Wolff could make and some interesting arguments. You know how. Um, um, it's hard to find get credit for them, etc., because they're an atypical form of um, or, uh, organization. And, um, you know, you could make an additional claim about how credit is limited via sort of uh, banking cartels, etc. I mean, I mean you know, I, I, I'd be you know, happy to go along with much of that. But then let's suppose we had an, like an agreed sort of like, you know, a fairer sort of uh, banking sector, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Would workplace democracy, would it be uh, a big, uh, big part of the economy? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think in most cases, probably not. And I think if, if it were to take place, it was to take place in companies with highly skilled workers 
um, who, um, th as it were, all, all the workers in the factory are on a sort of similar sort of skill and experience level. And th they would all have good input into uh, the production process. If you've got a situation where you have significantly more skilled and less skilled workers, well, obviously, there's high, as it were, the high skilled workers should get more votes. I mean, th that would seem to be uh, that would seem to be ob an obvious thing to do. So, uh, I mean, it might work in smaller companies. I mean, it certainly wouldn't work very well with large companies. I mean, you're never going to run a call center on workplace democracy because probably most of the workers there will vote for not working because working in call centers is unpleasant. Um, so, yeah, I, what you really want is the best mode of production. Now, I, I, I do see the argument that, yes, um, you know, there are limited amounts of places that uh, individuals can work, and that's limited by state action. I suppose this is a more of a cast night position than sort of Richard Wolf. And so, you know, the worker doesn't have as much bargaining power as he otherwise would. And so, you know, we might institute uh, as a workplace democracy as a way of sort of giving him more control uh, over his, um, his work. And I can see that to some extent. Um, but what we, what, if you want to make the lot of the lowest pay better, you don't want to be advocating for workplace democracy. As Dave Rimmer says, you want to be getting rid of intellectual property, you want to get rid of licensing laws, you want to make it so that there is greater competition for workers, so that each individual worker has uh, more control and can get a better package for himself. And if it is the case that the guy wants to be ordered around because he's not very good at organising himself, then fine. The big problem with, again, the um, the believers in big D democracies are just egalitarians. Um, they think that everybody has equal uh, ability. Well, no, they probably wouldn't go that far. But they would say that well, everybody has should have equal say in how their workplace is run or how the country is run. And it's like, well, that's far from self-evident. Um, most people are, uh, do. Most people engage in suboptimal decisions in their own uh, life, let alone trying to make decisions for other people. Um, so to extend that uh, around even the workplace just makes no sense. Also, I mean, if you're a good engineer, it doesn't mean you're a good manager. I mean, you might be able to technically produce stuff, but that doesn't mean you're going to produce stuff that people want to buy. Uh, that requires a different form of skill. Um, and so, the, yeah, you, you're likely to be outvoted um, by by those others. I mean, uh, but back to Foucault. I, I think Foucault. I, I would take issue with Foucault's a, a moralism but it's it's only the case you know the, the institutions that survive are those as it were that, that are the fittest given the certain um uh, constraints that they're in uh, the question arises you know to what extent do institutions create the conditions in which they operate rather than being at mercy of some sort of just impersonal forces that take place um so uh, that's the way I would take uh, that Taking a kind of view to democracy probably comes from, um, I suppose, those who go on about how America is a republic and not a democracy. And people like, say, uh, Peter Hitchens, who uh, are broad sort of conservative type figures and would say, well, historically, um, democracy of sorts has been a good way of uh, minimizing conflict and the concentration of power. Uh, but that's a pragmatic argument for democracy, which I think is significantly more defensible than an in principle, oh, democracy is good. So you could look, say, in English history and you say, you know, well, we've got these competing power centres of the nobles and the king. And then we've got parliaments and then we have the one of the narratives of the English Civil War. We have this absolute monarch in Charles I. And then he is brought to heel by the parliamentarians because they're. Uh, the, the sort of this uh, counterweight and you know we, we have all these different institutions and we, we vote for some and they're voting in different ways and this is a way of kind of re um, preventing uh, concentrations of power over uh, over and above what we can minimally uh, kind of allow and it allows decision making in those areas which couldn't be done on an individual basis so this position would assume a, a classic sort of free rider problem or coordination problem of a, a broadly anarchist society which is debatable of course but um you know that would be a, a, a way that you might defend democracy but these sorts of people aren't going to be going to ground saying oh we should have democracy in families we should have democracy in the workplace this is merely a democracy in the in sort of the political means because it achieves a, 
uh, a relatively good outcome and by relatively good outcome um, it, it provides a framework in which um, families businesses uh, civil organizations can uh, uh, work to their full potential in whatever sense and so creates a sort of co cohesive society as such uh, I, I think that's probably the most defensible form a def defensible version of democracy um, although um, it's not without its flaws. Would, would you agree with that, Tim? Yeah, I would agree that's the most defensible form of democracy. Um, two two factors, which speaking of Peter Hitchens, and Peter Hitchens' favorite, one of fav his favorite thinkers is Edmund Burke, and speaking of democracy, two things that go into it is time preference and those that aren't there. Two, two problems with it. And the first is, Edmund Burke's quote is, society is a per partnership of the dead, the living, and the unborn. That's from Edmund Burke. And another quote I was um, the good one is here is I mean, and this is Thomas Jefferson. Um, um, although Edmund Burke was pro-American Revolution, it's worth pointing out. Um, Thomas Jefferson, I am increasingly persuaded that the earth belongs exclusively to the living, and that one generation has no more right to bind another to its laws and judgments, and then then one independent nation has the right to command another. Um, those are those are two interesting two interesting quotes, and I'll bring up I'll bring up some of the issues that oftentimes um, um, come here. And I'll actually bring up a third quote, and this is, comes from the, some of the uh, uh, Steve, Seth and Gonzalo a while ago was on a podcast, and they had a Randy in there, and they were arguing over intellectual property. I think this is one of the my favorite things, and I think the Randy and gave Kinsella a good run for his money. Um, and one of the reasons that the Randy and supported intellectual property was the right to destroy something. Um, that was the that was his reasoning. You know, the idea that you know, if I write a book and I want to destroy it, I I should have the right to 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 take to retroactively take out all future possible copies of that book and totally eliminate it. Um, and I think that's actually a fairly interesting, nifty argument for it. Um, but then again, that's that that I'm gonna put that onto the both the Burkean and as well as the Jeffersonian critiques of that. Um, first of all, and, and one of the one of the quick one of the quick problems of time preference there is that you know do you are you allowed to destroy the current existing society um well currently we sort of have the technology to do you would use with and have disputed this with the existence of hydrogen weapons i would say that you know six hydrogen weapons six castle bravos or czar bombas and i think we could put enough radiation in the, you drop them in somewhere like yellow, you drop them in somewhere where a lot of food production has occurred. And considering the importance of eye pencil, we could kill a lot of people within a, a year or so if we drop six of them in all the food production areas. Um, uh, like let's say like right in February, or like right before the harvest season starts. I think you could kill a lot of people. So I think we do have a technology, like a Death Star technology, to destroy the Earth. Um, um, now. Now, now, if everyone voted to do that, would we have the right to do that? Well, I, th I think Jefferson here is correct. Now, I think Burke has the more moral position here, um, but I think Jefferson here is correct. You know, if Jefferson is correct in the sense that at times democracy functions as ifly, um, it has all preferences. I mean, maybe it ought to be that we should take about what the unborn and the uh, dead thing, you know, the living, the unborn, and the dead. But that's not always true. I mean, sometimes sometimes th th it's better to spend it. And then this also shows up in the debt financing. You know, U U.S. and Britain just took out huge deficits th for the coronavirus. And basically, I was recently on a forum here. I was thinking about this. is like, you know, the, the, if you, the COVID policy basically benefits people who are older. My home state, the average age of deaths are 82. Um, uh, the average age, I mean, most, hardly anyone under 30 or 40 has this, hardly anyone healthy has this, uh, who dies from this. So this, this is a policy, and the debt will mainly be paid for by the younger people, um, you know, the, the less, the closer to being unborn. And, and the unborn, the people being born in the next 10 years will pay for the debt. That's another reason why I think debt could be immoral. So, but, but then again, that's David Graeber. I do, uh, 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 but, but that, that's but that there. So, but, but then again, in climate change. You know, this is another argument. Now, I'm I'm of the view that sometimes is that that the sun is mainly driving this. Um, you can look this up. I think Alex Epstein has this view. Um, but even if you take the view seriously that we are functionally destroying the Earth, if you take the Jeffersonian view, who cares? I mean, we can live this nice, great life with high function, you know, moral case for fossil fuels. 
you know, it broke the Malthusian trap. We produced a lot of nice things. Um, and this also shows up in like the, 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 um, um, but yeah, I'll stop there, Swithin. So what do you make of those three, the three quotes here, Swithin, so far, and the view of time preference as well as, um, you know, the right to destroy? Swithin? I think it's interesting, the juxtaposition of uh, Burke and uh, Jefferson with uh, the living or the, um, the taking account of the dead, the unborn uh, and the living in case of Burke. And we've missed out the Democratic Party, which is taking into account the interests of uh, the living and the dead, but not the unborn. Um, that, of course, would be the, uh, the, the Democratic Party's view uh, of who, who counts in this case. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you think on your own individual level, I mean, it's kind of the case that most people would, would take the view, well, let's take the view of parents. Um, most people end up being parents. What they'll end up doing is they will do things for themselves and probably for their children. And, and depending on how old they are, the the values of uh, themselves or of their children would be greater or less. And to some extent, they would take into account what their parents may have done or what their parents may have thought or thought about the sort of the wisdom of the, of the elders or something like that. So parents will take into account um, kind of all three in a certain sense, but varying degrees. Um, it's but again, the, the difficulty is sort of taking, I think, uh, the kind of uh, centralized sort of state view of oh what should we as the state decide to do i think that's where the decisions kind of make less and less sense um because i mean i was thinking this in respect to sort of uh, the coronavirus responses by governments it's like well you know should we have more gdp or more old people that die i was like well that's not really a decision that anybody ever comes across or any or really actually means anything I mean, it's so far removed from any individual action that it's almost a meaningless decision. Uh, it, it's best to uh, create a framework in which individuals can make their own decisions. Then collectively, that ends up making a kind of a, a particular um, a, a, a particular decision, which kind of just uh, as a result of individual action, as it were. Um, with respect to um time preference um time preference is interesting um a lot of lots of psychological studies will show that people prefer to have things now than in the future and that's generally the case and that's perfectly fine i mean it makes sense that you would rather have things now than in the future because if you didn't everything else been equal you'd be dead and this is one of the uh because you'd never consume you would always produce and never consume because oh i'll produce i'll consume in the future it's like well, you've got to consume some things now or you die. And, and this is one of the reasons why I have very little sympathy for, oh, no, the world's resources are running out. It's like we need to keep them for future generations. It's like, well, should the future generations keep it for future generations? It's like, well, yes. It's like, well, if you take that logic, you're never going to use them. I'm like, what's the point? What's the point of having them there and not using them? That, that, that would uh, cease to make, seem to make absolutely zero sense at all. The problem is with democracy is that you can make decisions which are very short term, but don't actually uh, bear any of the cost of them. So in an individual base, if you spend all your your, your uh, work money on beer on Friday when you get paid, you can't pay for anything for the rest of the week. You bear those costs. In democracy, it's put on somebody else. The government will probably borrow money and then, well, the banks will pay and then you kick the can down the road. And actually you end up with a situation where with debt fueled uh, government expenditure, where it's very much focused on today uh, at the expense of uh, future generations, which people individually probably wouldn't do. They would actually be in their own individual decisions, um, their own deci individual decision making uh, exhibit um, lower time preference, um, a preference of trying to make things better in the future, more highly than they do when they vote just because of the um, the feedback loop which takes place. So uh, democracy, by taking away uh, the obvious stick that can hit you if you uh, are too short sighted and have very high time preference, it takes that away and actually makes society as a whole end up being more 
a, a higher time preference society than actually would exist if more decisions were allowed to be taken place on the individual level. Yeah, I, I agree. Time preference. This is where the happy and the this. I started to bring up a hapa. You know, oftentimes they'll say, well, libertarians don't believe in um, democracy, so they're not real anarchists or something like that. And I say, well, first of all, as we discussed, you guys don't really. The other team, so to speak, doesn't believe. The other tribe doesn't believe in democracy either. And second of all, time preference. This is this is, this is what actually got hapa in trouble supposedly as well. Um, that is an interesting concept. Um, the argument against debt, interestingly enough, you know, David Graeber has the history of debt, um, is, is, is in a way almost Austrian. I mean, it's it's the idea that you know, debt is a problem, it's a burden on the, the future. Um, so, so then don't have it. Um, or construct land owning schemes that don't require it. Now, I, I, this is where I've been somewhat persuaded by certain libertarians. It, it is true that the land owning schemes to get Certain things have been done improper, in air quote, poorly. Um, but then again, that's a original sin problem in a way. I mean, this goes back to the sort of, you know, the, you know, you just take Israel, for example. You know, you know, they're saying the Jews stole the land from the, the Palestinians. Well, it turns out like the, the, the Arabs probably stole it from the Romans. The Romans stole it from the Jews. And they're probably the original homesteaders. A similar case could be made with Britain, Italy, you know, South Africa, United States, Japan, South, wherever, Taiwan. You can make any case. You can make, there's a sort of, as far as land, so there's land ownership. And you get the, the Georgians, I think, who, you know, as that. So, so I, I, you, know, you know, so why do people need to go into debt? Well, they can't own, their, you know, they, they can't produce enough or they can't, uh, you know, own the means of production. Well, then again, the, producing a means of production is a hard task. You know, and this goes back to Hans Hoppe's Apple Orchard, where in an, whom exploits whom, where Hoppe actually argues the, the employees all probably on balance exploit the employer. Um, now, Rand, of course, has the quote that the big business and the most exploited group in the United States. I won't go that far, but you can make an intuitive case that based on time preference, um, the um, in a in a non crony capitalist system, the employer actually holds more risk than the dot. Now it's true that Citigroup, and this is according to WikiLeaks, um, and large corporations do feel like Barack Obama's cabinet. Apparently Citigroup, I recently learned this on Jimmy Dore's show, picked the whole Barack Obama's cabinet. So, you know, the first black president had his whole cabinet picked by Citigroup in advance, and that Citigroup got the first bailout program in the 2009 recession. I wonder how that happened. Um, um, but again, that's all brought to you by Michael Moore, uh, and I think Wolf probably told us to vote for Obama. Oh no, maybe he did not. Maybe Cornell West did not. Um, uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, um, yeah, I, I, I'm against debt to an extent. You know, my parents don't do it anyway. Um, you know, I, I now again, but then again, I'm also, you know, take take the Bernie Sanders program. I think, you know, no free, no no college debt. Well, how about we just get make colleges cheaper and get rid of them instead of making people take out hundred thousand dollars to go to debt. Or parents could save if they really want to send their kids there. Or we could just take the Brian Kaplan view and just have, you know, free lectures online um, and then just hire TAs to mark the tests. That's a cheaper way to resolve. So that, then we don't need debt anymore. Great. We don't need we don't need to spend all that. We don't need the lazy rivers either. We don't need these expensive dormitories either. So so I'm all in favor of less debt, less debt. Um, but that means you can't you can't buy the stuff you don't want slash you need. Um, so she don't need healthcare is tricky. Healthcare is tricky. I mean, a lot of the goods in there. But again, you could go, you could tack intellectual property, you could tack all sorts of things like that as well, and make the things cheaper. Um, but it is a labor-intensive thing. Um, producing MRI machines, X-ray machines, and all these things are a labor-intensive value thing. Um, this goes back to power being superior, and this requires time preference to create all these high capital goods. Um, um, and this is why I don't think it's. I, this is why I don't think anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction in terms. Um, 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 at all, uh, I, it, or at minimum, it's no more of a contradiction than anarcho-syndicalism is. Um, and one of the problems I have with anarcho-syndicalism is, is or anarcho at all, is is labor unions. Okay, trade unions. Let's say trade unions. For example, in the, it turns out the, the I think the local public school district I, I sued on behalf of the taxpayers, paid for by the taxpayers, the charter school that was um, coming up. Why? For asinine reasons. 
um, that were totally stupid. And why did they do that? Just to, you know, harass them. Um, so like in the public schools, I would argue, is a kind of tyrannical trade union. Um, and the, I brought this up on the Carson example about the railroads. Um, um, all the police unions as well. I mean, why, 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 why do police have no oversight? Well, they have a union. Um, and that union protects all the workers. They protect them too well. <laughs> they protect them too well. They're in a way like a private army. Um, um, so, so I mean, for all the critiques of private armies that get thrown at libertarians, we have a sort of pseudo public, air quote, private army that buys a lot of weaponized equipment. And actually, I agree with that very much so. Um, 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 but uh, so and I brought the example of the Pittsburgh rail strike against the Pennsylvania Railroad. One of the reasons the Pennsylvania Railroad was well, Pennsylvania Railroad was just thinking of laying off workers or merely not hiring them. The reason why they wanted a doublehead. Why doubleheading is probably more efficient. You run two locomotives instead of one. That makes cheaper goods. That makes cheaper goods. Now, what do all the extra railroad engineers and firemen do? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, that's a problem. Do rail passengers pay them? That that's that they could do that. We could have the progressive state pay them. You know, you could. I don't know. I mean, do they go on strike and vandalize the whole city? Do they? I don't know. I mean, this this is like, what do blacksmiths do if the steel makers come in and t put them out of business? What do truck drivers do if the, you know, self-driving cars put them out of business? I don't know. I don't have a clear solution. Not clear that anarcho syndicalists have a clear solution to these problems either. Um, um, either. Um, but. I will conclude on those things. Time preference is key, um, and you know, this is where reality matters too. And I, I, I do think the factors that put people in precarious positions are problematic, but I, I would be against them. So I think I would agree with you on on that. The fact that people buy uh, vast waves of consumer goods with uh, credit these days just doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody take any? Um, purchases a, a vast degree of purchases on board in which they get no return for it it, it strikes me as a it's a very strange um situation and historically taking on debt was considered a very sort of bad thing to do whereas we have sort of like uh flipped it around and glorified it uh which is is going to be a problem i think ultimately uh, when you come to workplace worker democracy etc is all systems you have you kind of want everybody in the best position for them to be in uh although i suppose from them or for the consumer but i mean for society as a whole let's, let's put it in that sense it's just that the the democracy democracy advocates are egalitarians and so think everyone should have a, have a say in it whereas uh, the sort of hitchens-esque defenders of sort of political democracy would be very much inegalitarian and hierarchical and go well you know fit yourself within uh, the system as best as possible and act accordingly you know if, if you're on the bottom fine there's dignity in being in the bottom if you're on the top well you there's honor in being in the top um but um different people are better suited to different places and that's where they should be the fact that there's no real justification that there should always be railroad workers i mean technology could supersede them uh, in the same way these people shouldn't always be in farmers um so as, as, you, as you point out, the anarcho syndicalist has problems with technological change, et cetera, et cetera. But I think all this goes to show is, again, that nobody believes purely majoritarian decision making for absolutely everything. And even it's re re very circumscribed and who can vote. And there's lots of additions. And really what the debate should be about is. Um, is what is the vision of society that you want to achieve and how you are going to achieve it? Uh, so on sort of the, the Wolf Friedman debate, uh, as Todd Lewis pointed out, you know, one of the major disputes there really is what is the nature of coercion. These are the sorts of uh, uh, conversations that need to take place rather than just standing behind slogans which have good connotations. And then those who, who believe in democracy then just accuse everyone else of being a fascist and therefore bad. Uh, this this kind of use of language goes back even to the early, relatively early 20th century, as George Orwell points out in uh, uh, politics in the English language. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone for listening. If you have enjoyed this, uh, please uh, subscribe to us on YouTube and share with your friends and family. Uh, and if you'd like to contact the show, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com.